Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be comparing uh, the SN2 and SN1 reactions right next to one another. So in previous videos I have talked about uh, the detailed descriptions of SN2 reactions and SN1 reaction. I do encourage you guys to watch those before you actually watching this or unless you already have a decent understanding on SN1 and SN2. So here I'm going to be comparing those side by side so that you can see the difference between those two. So to start out with, let's talk about the molecularity. As they specify, the SN2 reaction uh, will be needing both a, a good nucleophile and a good uh, alkyl halide, so their molecularity is going to be 2, and that's where that word 2 comes from, from your SN2 reactions. So this is, they are going to be bimolecular, which means they're going to be needing two chemicals or they're going to be having two chemicals in the rate determining step. On the other hand, when we're looking at the SN1 reaction, as the name specify one there, they are going to be unimolecular, which means they will be needing only, they will be uh, looking at only one type of chemical, one chemical in the rate determining step. And if I uh, remind you guys, in case of SN2, it was both the alkyl halide and it was your nucleophile that would be creating a molecularity of 2 there, but in case of SN1, it was only the alkyl halide that would be creating the uh, molecularity of unimolecular, and uh, your nucleophile is kind of irrelevant in case of SN1 reaction. So that's your first thing you want to look into for SN2, the difference between SN1 and SN2. When we're looking at the kinetics, your SN2, like we already know that it's in the bimolecular, so I would have the rate is going to be equal to some rate constant K, and it's going to be first order with respect to alkyl halide, and it's going to be first order with respect to your nucleophile. But on the other hand, when I'm looking at my SN1, since it's a unimolecular and we know it's only dependent on the alkyl halide, it's going to be K and Rx there. So that's going to be your. SN1, uh, that's going to be for the SN1, so you got to, overall your SN1 is going to be first order and uh, your SN2 is going to be a second order reaction. Let's talk about uh, elementary steps. So remember your SN1, SN2 reaction takes place in a one step. It's a one step mechanism, which is going to be also called concerted. Uh, on the other hand, your SN1 is going to be two-step mechanism at least. You could have a little bit more than two-step. You could have three-step depending on if you have an acid-base step at the end, but you have at least two steps there where you're going to have the first step is going to be the formation of carbocations. So if I you know, roughly draw how that's going to look like, so suppose I got this right there. So the first step would be the loss of leaving group. And that would be making an a carbocation there, plus Cl minus. And this uh, is going to be your rate determining step. And your second step is going to be the attack of nucleophile. So the first step is the formation of carbocation. The second step is going to be the attack of nucleophile. So I can have my carbocation that you just have made here. And I can have, let's say I got this nucleophile that's going to be attacking here and that's going to be making this nucleophile either coming out of the page and remember this uh, uh, once you create this carbocation it's going to be a trigonal planar center so you could have the nucleophile attack from the top or from the bottom so in that case you can also have the innate tumor of that or another way of saying you make the racemic mixtures so that's the elementary steps in case of uh, the sn1 mechanism but if you have an sn2 mechanism and i can probably take the same example here so but i'll probably just have a better nucleophile suppose now In SN2, if I have a stronger nucleophile, and I can talk about maybe let's suppose SH minus there, uh, it's going to be doing in one step where you're going to have the nucleophilic attack and you're going to have the loss of leaving grip at the same time. And then at the end of the day, you're going to have a complete inversion of configuration there. 
So it's going to be the SH there, and then you're going to have the CL minus there. So that takes place in one step. S and 1 takes place in two steps overall. There is going to be an, a complete inversion of configuration for the S and 2. And as far as your S and 1 go, there is going to be a formation of racemic mixture. So that's a big difference in terms of the stereochemistry. And we'll probably talk about that again in a little bit. What about uh, the type of alpha halide? So this is going to be the first thing that you're going to be looking into when you're trying to figure out whether a particular reaction will be doing SN1 or SN2. So when we're looking at our SN2, we prefer a methyl halide because we don't want to have too much hindrance because there got to be in a backside attack there. We got a methyl halide is preferred and then you can have a primary alpha halide you can also have a secondary alkyl halide, but tertiaries are usually unreactive toward your SN2 mechanism. So I'll probably just going to write that down here, that the tertiaries are not going to be doing any SN2 reactions. Okay, so that's a big difference there. When I'm looking at my SN1 mechanism, it's the opposite. We want to have, we want to be able to make a stable carbocation, and the tertiary carbocations are the most stable. So the tertiary, carb tertiary alkyl halides are going to be the preferred one in terms of doing the SN1, followed by the secondaries. And then your primaries and your methyls don't really do any SN1 mechanisms. So no SN1 there. And for these guys, for the tertiaries, no SN2 mechanism. So that's a big difference. So if you clearly have a primary alkyl halide and that's the very first thing you want to look for, it's got to be an SN2. If you have a tertiary alkyl halide, it's got to be the SN1. The problem steps in when you have a secondary alkyl halide because secondary alkyl halides could do SN1 and could do SN2 as well. And um, a lot of times students just forget to kind of follow the order and uh, they're going to be looking into something else before looking at the type of alkyl halide, and that needs to be looked at the, the uh, looked at first. If your alkyl halide cannot determine what type of mechanism you're going to be running, that's when you want to look at the nickel file and the solvent. But if you can figure out just based on the nature of alkyl halide, like primaries and the methyl will always going to be doing SN2, and your tertiary is always going to be doing SN1, then you don't really have to focus too much on your nickel files. But if it's a secondary, the secondaries is both. Um, it's on the SN2 and it's also on the SN1. That's when you want to look at your nickel files. Um, for SN2 mechanisms, you want to have a strong nickel file. And uh, obviously, your stronger nickel files are like OH minus, CN minus, OCH3 minus. I can talk about CH triple bond C minus. So th some of these strong nickel files are also strong bases, and you know that's going to be a, a discussion for a later day when a particular strong nickel file and strong base would be acting as a nickel file or would be acting as a base. So I'll talk about that later. But just know your strong nickel files roughly. Uh, usually going to have a negative charge on it. And there are some borderline nucleophiles that doesn't have a negative charge, but they are still considered to be in between the strong and weak. They are not super weak, but they're not super strong either. So chloride, bromide, and even iodide, that's going to be your stronger nucleophiles. And for as far as your S and 1 go, they can get away with a weak nucleophile. Okay, and weak nickel file is going to be H2O, typically CH3OH. I can have a CH3CH2OH there. And, uh, you know, this is something you're going to be looking into if you are a secondary alkyl halide. Like, suppose you have a tertiary alkyl halide and you have a stronger nickel file. Well, if you have a stronger nickel file and a tertiary alkyl halide, it's still going to be SN1. So, they can get away with a weak nickel file, but if they do have the SN1 reaction, do have a stronger nickel file, they can still be doing an SN1 if it's in a tertiary alkyl halide. It's uh, these 
stuff mainly applies whenever you're dealing with an secondary alkyl halide. If that doesn't help, you can always look at the solvents, what type of solvents you need in uh, SN2 mechanisms. Well, you're going to be needing polar aprotic solvents. And in case of SN1, you're going to be needing polar protic solvents. So the examples of polar aprotics are like DMSO, you can talk about DMF, acetone, ether, uh, acetonitrile. So those are some of the common examples you're going to be seeing for these uh, SN2 solvents. As far as your uh, SN1 go, they like to have polar protic solvents, so examples like water, uh, methanol, ethanol. The other example could be acetic acid, so CH3COOH, or the other example could be like ammonia. So they are all capable of making hydrogen bonds, so that makes them polar protic solvents. And if the solvents cannot make a hydrogen bond, but they are polar indeed, they are going to be polar aprotic solvents. In terms of stereochemistry, we briefly talked about it earlier, but I'll kind of mention that again now. Uh, for SN2, you're going to have a complete inversion of uh, configuration, or another way of saying these are going to be your stereo-specific reaction. Another way of saying what type of configuration of your products you're going to be getting is actually going to be dependent on your reactant. So there's going to be a complete inversion of configuration. If you started out with R, you're going to be making an S. And if you started out with an S, you're going to be making an R. So that's what the complete inversion in configuration means. As far as your S and 1 go, there is going to be formation of racemic mixtures. So that's not always the case. Uh, always keep in mind, if you have more than one chiral center in your starting material, and you're only messing up with uh, one of the chiral centers, then you could be getting in a diastereomers. So a racemic mixture is like an overall big picture, but you could very well get diastereomers if you have more than one chiral center. So that's something you want to keep in mind. So 50% R and 50% S in that particular case. As far as your possibilities go for the rearrangement, there is no carbocation formation in SN2 mechanism. There's not going to be any rearrangement related to carbocation either. So no rearrangements on those. Okay, as far as your SN1 go, obviously you do make carbocation and you can very well see possibilities of carbocation rearrangements there. And anytime you're doing an SN1 reaction, you want to make sure when you do make the carbocation, see if that's, your, that's the most stable carbocation that you could possibly have in that particular structure. If you can have a stable carbocation by doing a methyl shift or an hydride shift or even like in a ring opening or ring contraction, you want to do so so that you can get a stable carbocation there. As far as your energy profile diagrams go, for the SN2 mechanism, remember the SN2 mechanism takes place only in one step. So the one step means you're going to have only one energy hump. So I'll start with here, and I'm going to be making the products here. So products here, the reactants here. So this is going to be your activation energy. And on the top, this is uh, going to be your transition state or activated complex. Don't no intermediates formed in SN2 mechanisms. This transition state is the one where you're going to be showing the bond formation and the bond broken simultaneously. When I'm looking at my SN1 mechanism, typically SN1 is going to be happening at least in two steps. And like I said, you could have like in a you know, an acid-base step at the end of the day that could make it a third step, but for the most part, it's going to be a two-step mechanism where uh, typically your first step is going to be the rate determining step, is the formation of carbocation. So this is where your intermediates is going to be formed. 
if I can say carbocation. And then at the end of the day, you can have this going on to make the products. So this is going to be EA1, and this one right there is going to be your EA2. Clearly, you can say your EA1 is bigger than EA2 because that's your rate determining step. If you have two steps, you must be making two transition states. I'm going to have a transition state 1 here, and I'm going to have transition state 2 here. And like I said, if you're doing a acid-base reaction at the end of the day before you make your final product, then you may have a another step here so then you're going to have another intermediate second intermediate in that particular case so you're going to be drawing three energy hump there but for the most part your sn1 is going to be two step mechanism your sn2 is going to be a one step mechanism so this is going to be the overall pictures and comparisons of both sn1 and sn2 side by side and um, uh, the most challenging part for the students like i'm going to say that again is determining whether it's something is going to be going SN1 or SN2. And the very first thing you always want to look for is the type of alkyl halide you're really dealing with. And if you have a methyl halide or primary, it's got to be SN2. If it's a tertiary alkyl halide, then it's got to be SN1. The problem comes in whenever you're dealing with secondary alkyl halide, and that's when you can focus a little bit more on the nature of your nickel file and the type of solvent in that particular case. All right, so if you have any questions on any of those concepts, uh, we'll have another video where I'm going to be doing multiple examples and kind of going over those, how something is SN1 and SN2.